Um, so I want to uh, thank you again for joining us. I want to introduce uh, Jennifer Bogan. She is the founder and the executive director of the Field Center here in Northampton. Um, and she uh, has been uh, started the Field Center nearly 20 years ago uh, now and has been caring for children with uh, neurodiverse individuals and children with autism for uh, uh, a long and storied career. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us here today. Uh, autism is, and has changed so much during my career and uh, even just in the last couple of years uh, that we're excited to present this to you. What I'd like to, what we're planning to do is to have Jennifer, uh, she has a, a presentation here talking about uh, uh, autism from diagnosis through treatment. And uh, if you have questions along the way, you're welcome to put them in the chat. We're hoping to um, hold most of the questions until the end of the uh, presentation. And then if you put those questions into the chat, I can share them and we can talk about them here uh, on the workshop. And so with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer and let you go. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Everett. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I'm excited. I'm still getting used to the Zoom presentation because there's no feedback. And I'm definitely, uh, you know, thankful for all of you to come and um, participate in this. So um, as Dr. Everett said, I've been working in the field of autism for uh, about 20 years, which feels like makes me feel old, but that's okay. Um, but I'd like to start and talk about the approach that I take to my work um, and a little bit about myself as well. So I started my career like many people did as a direct support professional. So I was a paraprofessional in a therapeutic nursery school for children with autism and children with emotional and behavioral challenges or disturbances that they called at that time. Um, and I pretty quickly realized that it was just strange that they would put these two groups together because they had vastly different needs, vastly different uh, skill deficits and areas of strength, and it didn't really make sense. So I started learning more about how to support um, children with autism through that. Um, after that, I went back to um, school and um, got my board certification in behavior analysis, which is one of the treatment methods that we'll discuss today a little more. And I did some research out at uh, UC Davis in California. I then went to Washington, D.C. to do some advocacy work on the Combating Autism Act, which was very poorly named at the time. It's now um, <laughs> Autism Cares Act, which is uh, a much nicer name. Um, and then I started the Field Center, um, as Dr. Everett said about, um, yeah, about 20 years ago. But before I was any of these things, I was the sister to this handsome guy here. This is my brother, Christopher. Uh, Christopher is a young adult. Um, he's 36 now. Um, and he has uh, autism and he has schizophrenia. So he has two uh, what we call co-occurring conditions that make it um, challenging for him to find work and have self-care skills and all these different things. You can see him here with his therapy cat. You can also tell if you, if you notice that his eyes are all puffy because he was allergic to the cat, uh, but that didn't uh, stop anyone at ServiceNet from letting him have the cat. So that's, that's how it happens. Um, Christopher being a um, young man of average um, intelligence, he did not have an intellectual, he does not have an intellectual disability, um, met and married a girl named Sarah, uh, not married, but they got together. And Sarah has um, been diagnosed with Asperger's, which is the way we used to talk about high functioning autism. And you might notice something about Sarah in this picture that she is in fact pregnant. And they had this little guy named Darian. Um, Darian, I have some slides of Darian at, at the age of five. He is now nine. Uh, so these are even a little outdated. Um, so this is the first picture of Darian. And 
as you can see, there's some differences, some key sort of differences apparent even in this still picture uh, about Darien. So if we were in person, I would now ask you what sorts of things you notice. Um, if you notice his gaze is completely in a different place than his parents' gaze. Um, so he's, he's looking completely the other way. Also, this was his birthday. Uh, I guess it was his fourth birthday. And um, instead of that sort of happy, excited kind of affect or, or way his face is looking, um, he looks kind of nervous and, and, and sort of scared. Um, this is the next picture of Darian. This is him again at, at around five years old. And you can see here he's, he's lining up um, cars. While we would typically see a, even a younger child um, do something with the ramp or, you know, push the cars along there or have a race or, or whatever. But Darian was really um, stuck or what we call perseverating on, on, the, um, on the cars there. So this is a, a more recent um, family shot of them actually at the, at the field center. And right now, um, Darian does have a diagnosis of autism as well as a speech delay and some global developmental delays. But um, so this is where I take, um, where I build my work from is from a family perspective and going through as young as early intervention all the way up through adult services with this, um, with my family. So um, the first thing that people always ask or often ask is how is autism diagnosed? Um, diagnosing autism can be difficult. There's no medical test like a blood test, although there are emerging um, MRIs and fMRIs that are looking at um, you know, uh, head circumference and different lobes of the brain and when they light up and things like that. But right now there's no definitive um, blood test. So doctors um, like Dr. Effort need to look at a developmental history and behavior to make a diagnosis. So this is the first video I'm gonna show. It's um, pretty short, it's from Kennedy Krieger Institute. And I want you to pay really close attention to looking at the, um, the children and the, the infants and the babies that they're talking about and noticing the differences between how they engage with toys their parents, caregivers, and the environment. I'm Rebecca Landa, director of the Center for Autism and Related Disorders at Kennedy Krieger Institute. You are about to watch a brief tutorial illustrating the early signs of autism spectrum disorders, or ASD. You will see three pairs of videos of one-year-olds. Within each pair, you will first see a child with neurotypical development, followed by a child who shows early signs of ASD. The developmental features indicative of ASD shown within these videos fall into three main categories. These include effective communication and sharing enjoyment, making social connections, and the one with which we will begin seeing social opportunity through play. This 19 month old child does not show signs of ASD. He has chosen to play with the balls. He quickly integrates the lady into his play. He pretends that the balls are food and offers a bite to the lady. Pretends a lot of stuff is clean, but he always wants you to eat it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're making some yummy food. He understands that food, spoons, plates, and eating go together. As he creates a pretend play activity, he remains aware of the people nearby. He enjoys incorporating social interaction into his play and offers the lady a bite. Thank you. That sure is tasty. He is able to pay attention to the lady, the doll, and the pretend food all at once. He shares his excitement about the toys with the lady looking at her and smiling. After the lady comments that the food is hot, he links his play and language to her idea. It's okay. No, it's cool. It's nice and cool. Yeah. <laughs> Here, he imitates the lady's action with the pretend lipstick. Oh, my lipstick. Bring it out. My lipstick on. This helps him to learn new play skills and at the same time, synchronize his actions with the actions of others. 
Yeah, she has lipstick on. Oh, just like mommy wears. You look so pretty. Thank you. This 19-month-old child shows signs of ASD. He has an intense yeah, interest uh, in the toy phone. Toys are also he does not share his enjoyment of the phone with others. He does not look toward others and smile. Shows, um, you know, sensory or He really has this addiction to telephones lately, though. Know. It's okay though because it's helping him to down. So there's probably like ten telephones laying around my house because he walks around carrying them and sits them down, and then he goes on to the next one. Although he puts the phone to his ear, he does not show creative play with the phone. When his name is called, he does not respond. Elliot. Ellie. Ellie. Elliot. He does not offer the phone to others so that they can have a turn. Progressively, he's not. His mother tries to distract his attention away from the phone. The mommy see the phone. The mommy see it. The mommy see the phone. She begins to tickle him. Although he seems to enjoy the tickling, he does not look at his mother or make a social connection with her. He does not try to communicate with his mom to keep the social game going. This 14-month-old child has a mild motor delay, but does not show signs of ASD. As he explores the new toy, he remains aware of the people nearby. He checks in with his mother behind him to ensure that she also sees the toy. Next, he shows that he understands the social communicative meaning of the woman's pointing gesture by immediately looking at the sticker. Then he looks over at another sticker she had pointed out before. He continues the woman's topic of communication as he points to the Tigger sticker. He shows the motivation to maintain social engagement with others and the ability to communicate using coordinated gaze, vocalization, and gesture. This 14-month-old shows signs of ASD. First, he flaps his hands while enjoying the bubbles. He does not share his enjoyment by looking at the man. He does not respond to his name. Ben. Ben. <laughs> ben. Although he looks at the man's pointed finger, he does not follow the direction of the man's gesture to locate the object of the man's attention. This 14-month-old does not show signs of ASD. While she enjoys looking at and exploring the toy, she stays engaged with the people nearby. She tries to share her enjoyment with her mother as she turns to show the toy to her. Then she shares her enjoyment with the lady across from her by directing her gaze and smile toward the lady. Also, she recognizes that the lady is a source of help. Her request for help is clear and effective. Coordinating eye contact, gesture, and vocalization for purposeful communication is a sign of healthy social and communication development. This 14-month-old child shows signs of ASD. Notice how his attention is so focused on the toy that he does not interact with the people nearby. He does not share his attention with others. His exploration of the toy is also unusual. He drops the toy onto the table and watches it move. When the toy stops moving, he does not use eye contact, vocalization, or gesture to ask for help. He also tenses his body and mouth in an unusual way. Do it again. 
Even though the lady is talking to him, he shows no interest in her. He does not seem to understand that her gesture is an offer to help him. He does not check in with the lady or his mother to see whether they are paying attention to the toy that he is enjoying. Okay. Oops. So, um, that's a little bit, I thought it was uh, easier sometimes to actually look and notice and see um, some of those symptoms and what uh, ASD looks like even in a very young child. So um, the way that we diagnose um, many uh, disorders or differences is through what's called the DSM or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And we are in the fifth version of that. And in the fifth version, we um, have now called autism spectrum disorder. And as opposed to the previous, which was autism spectrum disorders, including Asperger's and pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. So now they're all connected into one. Um, and as you can see from this chart, the core symptoms of the autism are now two, there are two categories of core symptoms. One is the impaired social communication and interaction. And to have autism, a, a child or an individual must have all three of these present. Uh, social reciprocity, nonverbal communication, I'm sorry, all three of these must be delayed. Uh, social reciprocity, nonverbal communication, and difficulty maintaining relationships. The other one is the restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior. And there, there needs to be two of the four of these need to be present. So repetitive speech and behavior, insistence on sameness, restricted interest, and sensory abnormalities. And the sensory piece, interestingly, is also new to the DSM-5. We're going to talk about some of the comorbidities or co-occurring conditions in a little bit. So the first thing that um, uh, doctors like Dr. Everett and the people at NAP are going to do typically is use a screening tool. A screening tool is not a diagnostic tool for autism, but it basically completes some kind of a questionnaire. There might be um, some items that you might have the child do or they might have the child do. And they're going to look to see if the child is at risk for having aut autism spectrum disorder. Um, these are some of the common screening tools. And I should say that all of these are, are linkable. So. Um, hopefully the NAP will be able to post them. The diagnostic tools, there aren't as many diagnostic tools that have the efficacy behind them. Um, but the sort of gold standard one is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule or the ADOS. Um, there's a generic one and then there's different modules for different age groups. There's a toddler module all the way up through a verbal adult. There's the autism diagnosis interview, which is typically connected with the ADOS, as well as the childhood autism rating scale and the Gilliam autism rating scale. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure I did in this presentation was give you um, plenty of opportunities to find some resources that are online and openly available. So I'm going to attempt to link on this and let's see if this works. So this is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Learn the Signs Act Early page. And as you can see here, there's lots and lots of resources. They're all open, um, open source and you're able to use them. Uh, they give lists of what to do about if you're concerned about your child's development, milestone trackers, um, questions about developmental screenings, and there is a really cool video library, um, similar to the one that we just saw about milestones in action. And it's looking at little videos and some pictures of what children should be doing at these ages. So I find that a really interesting resource. And again, um, you can click to that. So talking now about some of the other comorbidities or co-occurring conditions, you can see here that there are cognitive um, or brain um, related co-occurring conditions. One of them is intellectual disability. So that means that someone can have ASD and have a very high IQ or 
um, almost a genius level or be at a genius level, or someone can have a very low IQ and have an intellectual disability, a significant intellectual disability. And those are both on that spectrum of autism. The same with the language impairment. Um, I work with individuals who are completely nonverbal and might use other means of communication like assistive technology or sign or, or other things. Um, and then there's also individuals who can sort of talk your ear off about a, a, a topic or something that's of interest to them. So those are the main cognitive co-occurring conditions. And then you see here with the behavioral ones, there is hyperactivity and impulsivity, sort of like you would see with someone with ADHD, um, agitation and aggression, which sometimes can lead to challenging behaviors, and anxiety. And the reason I bring these up is because when we talk about treatments, it's important that you are treating all of these co-occurring conditions and um, in your work with the child or with the family or with your family. And then there's medical co-occurring conditions that we know are common. Seizure disorders are very common among the autism population, as well as GI and constipation issues. There are um, genetic variants up there that are, um, <laughs> I have trouble understanding all of them, but um, the genome sequencing, looking at them. And then there's these biomarkers, which I mentioned in terms of an EEG, uh, neuroimaging, altered brain um, region size, and um, macrocephaly and hyperserotonemia. <laughs> so um, this is a, a quick video here of a mom talking about her um, child that later got diagnosed with autism. I just had a gut feeling from, I'd say maybe 10 or 11 months that there was something wrong. And I had spoken to my pediatrician about it. And of course my pediatrician knew nothing about autism or how to diagnose it. So she told me that it was probably just a phase that he would grow out of it. And I should have gone with my gut feeling because I waited about another five months before I took him for a hearing test to rule out, you know, being deaf or having a hearing problem. And then I had him evaluated. And that's when I first found out that he showed signs of autism. So unfortunately, while well, this never happens at NAP, of course, um, this is a, a common occurrence that a lot of people face. Oops. Pause that there. Um, and uh, it can be really challenging for families to try to get the diagnosis. And we do know that the earlier a child is diagnosed, the much more um, they're able to access treatments and interventions and have a positive trajectory and ultimately reach optimal um, outcomes, which is what we're hoping for, for all of our children. Um, some quick autism numbers. So every two years or so, the CDC comes out with data from their Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network or Mo ADAM Network. And they recently, um, in about a year ago, said that um, according to their data, one in every 45 children was having an autism spectrum disorder. So as you can see here, this chart, this, this actually, um, the grid itself just goes to 2020. But as you can see, we were looking in 2004, and when I was just starting out in the autism world, um, one in 166. So we have um, definitely uh, increased in diagnosis. We've increased in lots of ways. And I'm not going to talk about um, all of that tonight in terms of what is causing this increase, but we do know that it's multiple factors. It's not just one thing. So a lot of times I hear um, from families or from caregivers or from educators, but they're so blank, how could they be on the spectrum? Um, so things like they're so smart, uh, they have a variety of friendships, uh, they're totally verbal, how could they be on the spectrum? And again, I like this um, chart here because it really shows that 
there's what we call the themes, right? So these are the themes that everyone on the autism spectrum has. And then there's the variation within these themes. And one I wanna point out is the behaviors. So there's um, highly repetitive behaviors such as hand, fly, hand flapping, uh, touching things, biting hands, those kinds of things, um, all the way to um, more sort of mild behaviors like making jokes when it's inappropriate, things like that. So I think it's really important to think about um, not just our sort of preconceived notions about what autism is, but also all the variations that exist. So I was talking to Dr. Everett and Lauren before this presentation and saying, you know, this is this has actually changed a lot. My presentation has changed a lot in the last um, really three to five years. And one of the big changes is that we now talk about neurodiversity. So neurodiversity um, refers to an individual who has a less typical cognitive variation. So it could be autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia. It refers to individuals of typical development and intellectual and cognitive functioning. So the question is, is neurodiversity a disability? It's broadly defined as an approach to learning and disability that suggests diverse neurological conditions appear as a result of normal human vari normal variations in the human genome. So instead of a disability or a disabling condition, some people feel like it is more of a difference of approach. We're gonna watch one more video here about neurodiversity. This episode about neurodiversity is sponsored by Wondrium. Stick around till the end of the video to learn more about it. Hello, Brains. I talk about neurodiversity a lot on this channel, in panels, at talks, but what exactly does neurodiversity mean? Neurodiversity, noun, is the concept that there is natural variation in the human brain that leads to differences in how we think and behave. It's short for neurological diversity. Neurodiversity. The term was first coined in the 1990s by a sociologist named Judy Singer, who argues that neurological differences, like autism, are just that, neurological differences. In other words, different brains work differently. Neurodiversity exists, just like diversity exists in ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation. Those of us with ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, Tourette's, those who are neurotypical, and those who are autistic, all have brains that are hardwired to work and learn differently. And even brains within each group are wired differently and have a spectrum of abilities. And while we can sometimes learn to mask those differences, those differences are still going to exist. And trying to pretend they don't or being told that they shouldn't often comes at a high cost to our sense of self and our mental and physical well-being. Often putting our brain's operating system at higher risk for the mental health equivalent of malware, such as anxiety or depression, which is why the neurodiversity movement exists. The neurodiversity movement is a social movement historically led by autistic self-advocates and other neurodivergent activists. Advocating for the acceptance of the autism spectrum is reflecting natural variations in the human brain rather than a disease that needs to be cured. This movement has grown within the autism community as well as to other neurodivergent folks. Hi. I have ADHD. <laughs> While neurodiversity advocates might disagree on some things, and I obviously can't speak for everyone, there are a few key assumptions within the neurodiversity paradigm. One, neurodiversity exists. Different brains work differently and have distinct strengths and weaknesses. Two, neurodiversity is valuable. Differences in how our brains work allow us to come at things from different perspectives, have vastly different skill sets, and accomplish more than we could if everyone's brain worked the same way. Three, the potentially disabling challenges that those of us who are neurodivergent face aren't necessarily inherent to our brain's differences, but often a result of the social and physical environments neurominorities exist within, which is highlighted perfectly in a blog post about the concerning condition called neurotypicality written from an autistic perspective. The blog, which is satire, presents a world in which neurotypical brains are the neurominorities and discusses how odd those brains would seem and the challenges they would face in an autistic world. A personal example, I'm very nearsighted. If I didn't live in a society that provided glasses and contacts, I would be disabled. The neurodiversity movement is a bit controversial in that it upends some of how we've thought about these things for a really long time. But most of the criticisms of the neurodiversity movement seem to come from misunderstandings of what it actually is. A lot of critics of the neurodiversity movement argue that viewing autism as just a natural variation implies that autistic people don't need any support. But in response to this criticism, one autism researcher and advocate explains it well. Neurodiversity advocates generally consider autism to be both a natural variation and a disability. Advocates therefore concur 
currently campaign for acceptance and respect for autistic people as valuable members of society and also fight for appropriate support and services to meet the needs of the autistic community. And the same is true of most ADHD advocates. We recognize that life is hard for us and there are times where it would be easier to not have ADHD. But a lot of what we struggle with is because of environmental and social factors and can be mitigated through creating social and physical environments that account for and accommodate neurodiversity. That doesn't mean we reject medical treatment. As a neurodiversity advocate with ADHD, I'm working toward a world that recognizes, appreciates, and accommodates neurodiversity. I also have a therapist and take meds. Acceptance of my brain's differences and support for the challenges I face are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they both work toward the same goal, a better quality of life. Okay. So um, one thing that I find uh, challenging in the field, and again, I know this never happens at NAP, Dr. Everett, uh, is something I call the diagnose and adios phenomenon. And basically, sometimes parents um, or caregivers are given, uh, their child receives a diagnosis of autism, or if they're an adult or a young adult, they receive a diagnosis of autism, and then they're sort of left deciding what to do with it. So they go where many people go to find answers and they go to Google. And on Google, I have Dr. Evil there uh, as a, a little dated um, reference, but basically you can go down the rabbit hole very, very easily. So as you can see, there's 163 billion billion results in under um, in 0.74 seconds. And um, that is just from a Google search of autism treatments and therapies. And here's some of the ones that you get. So post-diagnosis, there are options for the type of treatment you seek for your child in theory, right? There's possibilities all over the place. But often parents are left feeling more like this, like what the heck? <laughs> and trying to figure out what is going to work best. So there are some resources, and again, all of these are clickable. One of my favorite resources is the Autism Speaks 100-Day day, day Kit for Families of um, Newly Diagnosed Children with Autism. The Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, or ASAN, has this wonderful book, Welcome, or guidebook, Welcome to the Autistic Community. And the Autism Handbook by Joe um, Beal is another one that's I, just really fantastic. So there's lots of books, there's lots of resources out there. And my goal is to give parents and individuals who are, con um, who are concerned, whether they be caregivers, parents of young children, um, ways to research more and look into it. And these are all free, I should say. But the most important thing to remember is that any intervention or treatment needs to fit your family. It needs to fit your family culture, your individual child's needs. If your child has, if you have other children, the siblings needs, time and schedule restraints and financial feasibility. So those are all really critical things that people don't always understand how important they are when you're picking what kind of intervention or if you're going to intervene at all with your child's development. Many current treatments for ASD seek to reduce symptoms that interfere with daily functioning and quality of life. But since ASD affects each person differently, there are unique strengths and challenges and different treatment needs. Therefore, treatment plans usually involve multiple professionals. One woman, um, Dr. Temple Grandin, who is an adult uh, autistic self-advocate, um, says, one of the things I like about autism is it really makes everyone work together. And it's true because there's more than one system affected when a child has autism. So they need more than just speech therapy or behavior therapy. There's occupational therapy and physical therapy and educational treatment and all of the above. We're gonna go through and, and talk about those briefly. Um, so these are some of the categories, broad categories of the different types of treatment. Um, the first one we're gonna talk about is developmental. Developmental approaches focus on improving a broader range of developmental skills language skills, physical skills, sensory skills. They're often combined with behavioral approaches. We have speech therapy, occupational therapy, sensory integration therapy or strategies, and physical therapy. So this is a, a visual that I really enjoy looking at. A, a psycholo late psychologist, Dr. Teresa Bullock, had this house of human development, she calls it. 
And at the bottom here, under the ground where you can't see, you see the sensory motor processing. And Dr. Bullock will talk about how, or we talk about how the sensory motor processing is the, the real basement and the foundation of the developmental skills and the ability to develop. The next step also um, under the ground, so you can't see, is the self-regulation and adaptability. And sometimes we talk about coping skills. So the ability to regulate oneself depending on the environment, to do the life skills that they need to do, and to adapt to changes in the routine. Then we get over the ground, right? So we can see and observe these things. We look at the communication and language. Next, we look at cognitive development or sometimes pre-academic and the social and emotional competence. And it's not till the very end, the very top to the house that we get to overt behavior. So when we're talking about a developmental approach, we're looking at these areas, these three areas here. And when we talk about a behavioral approach, we're talking more about the overt behavior. This is a brief video of Dr. Sally Rogers doing a um, developmental approach. It's called the Early Start Denver Model. And while there are some behavioral aspects to this approach, it is strongly developmental. And this is her working with a, uh, I think a two-year-old. Feet. You want to play feet? You want to play feet? Feet. That's my game, isn't it? Feet. Yeah. Yeah. Feet. Bake your skin. Bake some feet. Roll them up and roll them up and roll them up More feet. 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 Okay. Patty feet. Patty feet. Take your skin. Take your skin. Roll them up and roll them up. 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 Toes, toes, toes. Feet. Roll them up and roll them up. So as you can see here, um, the, the doctor, Dr. Rogers, is trying to engage this child through what we would call a sensory social routine. So she's um, providing hands-on support and really moving him around, um, moving his feet around, and trying to get him by holding back on the activity to initiate some level of communication. So first he claps his hands, then she says, oh, you want more feet, more feet. Um, and then he does eventually start babbling. So this is a good example of a developmental approach. Behavioral approaches have been the most, have the most evidence for treating symptoms of ASD. They've become widely accepted among educators and healthcare professionals and are used in many schools and treatment clinics. A notable behavioral treatment for people with ASD is called applied behavior analysis. Now, I am a behavior analyst by training. That was what my training has been in. Um, I'm a board certified behavior analyst. And there's been lots of controversy around um, ABA recently because a lot of autistic adults are able to say, hey, that did not work for me. And so it's really important for me as a practitioner to remember and hear that and hear people's real life experiences and make sure that my treatment is informed by what they, the autistic individuals are telling me. 
So I mentioned um, Dr. Tempo Grandin a little earlier. Dr. Um, Grandin talked about a small group conversation is like walking on stilts on an icy road. So this is a little picture of the icy road here. And um, as a behaviorist, I consider our job to clean up the ice, right? And um, the ice in this metaphor is the sensory processing or the sensory system. So this is a, you might've seen this before, this is a um, simulation of a sensory processing and basically sensory overload. Basically what that means is individuals on the autism spectrum take in the environment in ways that may be atypical to the way other neurotypical individuals do. And this is a really nice um, example of that. So it seems like there wasn't any sound with that, so I apologize. Um, and I would encourage you to look it up online. Basically, um, the whole time that the child was, or the young boy was outside, it was really loud and, and very noisy for him and difficult for him. And then the whole time that he was inside, it was the same. And you, you, know, you can notice that there were different things, um, you might not notice because there wasn't sound, but uh, there were different things that would make sounds that we wouldn't necessarily hear, like someone tapping their shoe, someone drinking coffee, that kind of thing. So the other piece of this is to teach people how to walk on stilts. And we do that often through behavioral interventions like applied behavior analysis. And I think it's really important to think about this in this metaphor that uh, from Temple Grandin, that um, we're not trying to pull people down off their stilts, we're not trying to change who they are, but we're trying to teach them how to walk more safely um, and, and um, to enjoy. So hopefully the sound is gonna work on this one. This is me uh, a number of years ago, as you can see, working with a young boy named Edward. Edward was uh, right about four, four years old with this, in this video. And we're doing what's called discrete trial teaching or discrete trial training. And the reason I show this one is because you can tell how engaged we are together, how much fun we're having together. And often ABA and specifically discrete trials are seen as these sort of robotic and um, not engaging, not relationship-based pieces. And so I show this one to, to show how engaging and relationship-based discrete trial can be. Hopefully the sound will work. Okay, you ready? Edward, yes. go find <laughs> the blue. <laughs> Good. Nice. 
Put glue in. Glue. Glue in. Nice job. Go find purple. Go. It's purple. It's purple. Put purple in. Okay, ready? Listen, Edward. Go find yellow and green. So you can see that I'm upping the ante a little bit and trying to get him to Go have find two. Yellow and green. Found green. Find green. Go find green. yellow and green. And go <laughs> Nice job. Put yellow and green in. <laughs> nice job. Nice job. A five. In the middle. Down low. Okay. So as you can see here, he's having a good time. I'm having a good time. He's certainly learning his colors, but much more importantly, he's learning to uh, engage, to follow directions. And I don't need to give him a sticker or stars or, or anything like that um, because he is intrinsically motivated, um, which is a great, which is great. Okay. Um, some of the other approaches, there's an educational approach. And one of them is called TEACH, the Treatment and Education of Autistic and Related Communication Handicapped Children. TEACH is based on the idea that people with autism thrive on consistency and visual learning. And then there's the social relational um, treatments, which focus on social skills and emotional bonds. One of the most common ones that we used to have in our area um, is called Floor Time. And it encourages parents and therapists to follow the interests of the individual to expand opportunities for communication. There's also the um, method called RDI, Relationship Development Intervention, Social Stories, um, and Social Skills Groups. So I don't think we have time for um, the floor time. What? Oops. Okay. Right now, but we can come back to it if we end up with more time. Uh, pharmacological interventions. There's no medicines that treat the core symptoms of autism, but there are medicines, if you think about that chart with all, all those co occurring conditions, that can help people with autism function better. The Autism Treatment Network, uh, th through a grant with Autism Speaks, created a decision aid for parents of children with autism to decide if their children should take. Um, medicine for their challenging behavior. It's really, int uh, really interesting. It's an excellent resource. And it just goes through the, the culture of your family and, and how you feel about these different things and whether or not your child um, comes up with a recommendation about medicine. And then there's psychological approaches um, to help people with cope with anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues. Cognitive behavior therapy or CBT is one of the approaches that focuses on learning the connections between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Uh, CBT is incredibly effective for individuals all across the age span with, with autism, even from little kids where you can teach them the differences between a thought and a feeling and a behavior um, all the way up to adulthood. This is a, a quick little video. I'll just show part of it on um, CBT for autism. At any time, people are having thoughts, like happy thoughts. I love my new video game. Waffles for breakfast, yum. Grandpa is coming today. Like regular thoughts. I see a dog. Today is Tuesday. I hear a car going by. Minds are busy places where people are always having thoughts. Thoughts compete with each other to be the ones on top, to be the ones that are on your mind the most. If happier thoughts get on top, you feel better, 
My video game broke. My stuff always breaks. One month till my birthday. I can get new ones. So that's just an example of a um, CBT video. It's actually made for children, I should have said that, uh, to learn about their thoughts, feelings, and how it could affect their behavior. At any time, people... And finally, um, there's complementary and alternative treatments for autism. Um, sometimes CAM treatments can be um, supplementing a more traditional approach, like a special diet, herbal supplement, chiropractic care, animal therapy, arts therapy, mindfulness, or relaxation therapies. So I'm finishing up now, and I want to say this all looks great, but who pays for this? Um, most families don't have the budget. There's lots of barriers to um, finding this, the best treatment for your child. So this is just a little chart to look at when a child is um, an infant to three years of age, we have early intervention services and that goes through the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. From the age of three to 22 years, we go through DESE or the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and your child and adolescent is served through the IEP process at your local school district. And then when a child turns over, when a young adult is over 22 years of age, they are served by the Department of Developmental Services or DDS. But there are of course barriers to treatment. One of the big ones that I see a lot is wait lists, funding, finding the right services, paying for the right services, and the right services even being available. And staffing. Staffing has been a huge issue recently because, well, it's a huge issue everywhere, um, but it is certainly a huge issue in the autism community and the autism treatment community because we just can't find people to work for us. And then finally, the quality is the, is the big piece there, is looking at what outside um, in your community, within your community, is there available and how high quality is it? So what can you do as families, as parents and as caregivers? You can be creative. Um, maybe that babysitter you had 10 years ago when your child was an infant would want to learn something about floor time. Uh, they could come back. Be persistent. I tell parents all the time, just call, call, call. Uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Be organized, know who you called, when you called and what you said. Um, be informed of your rights. There's lots of um, stuff online too about what your rights are as a parent of a special needs child. And you need to be flexible because you might not find the perfect treatment situation right away. But if you're flexible enough, you can help shape and mold it into what's going to work best for your family. And then most importantly is to be kind to yourself because none of this is easy. I talk to parents all the time and I say this is you are a, a wonderful parent put in an extraordinary circumstance to parent a child on the autism spectrum or a neurodiverse child. So it's really important to get that cup of tea, uh, do what you need to do to be kind to yourself. I am almost completed, but I just want to give a very brief five minute plug for the Field Center. Uh, the Field Center is the organization that I founded. We support neurodiversity and community. Um, these are a couple pictures from the field center. We have a sensory room, a uh, block area. That's part of the sensory room. <laughs> we do Dungeons and Dragons groups. And this is some of the staff members that we have at the field center. We have three areas of impact. We have the family navigation program, which I'll talk a little bit more about, the community center and school-based consultation. The family navigation program is a one-to-one -one consultative programs that helps parents and caregivers on their journey to support their neurodiverse loved one. And these are some of the offerings that we have for families at the center. We have our social connection groups. We have a sensory social group for children under the age of five. We have Lego groups for seven to 10 year olds and Dungeons and Dragons for tween to adults. We uh, rent out the center for sensory friendly birthday party rentals. We had one here today. And we have a life guide coaching program for um, autistic adults. And finally, the family navigation program offers a couple different services. One is ABA gap services. While families are waiting or on a wait list to get services from insurance covered um, provider, 
in home support, parent training, school consults, and behavioral assessments. So that is all I have today. Thank you again very much for participating and being online. And uh, Dr. Everett, I believe, is going to share some questions with us. Right. Well, thank you, Jennifer, so much for sharing it. There's so much information in there and uh, just such a wide topic. And you did really thank you for sharing all of that. Um, as to the reminder, this um, is being recorded and a lot of the, the um, links that were shared during this um, presentation will be available on our website uh, in a few days after we get it all set up. Uh, so yes, if there are questions that people want to share, you can um, you know put them right into the chat. Uh, I think we have a small enough group where if it's a complicated question, we could potentially unmute as well. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and ask any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I wanted to take a few moments and um, uh, just share just a few things about. I, I just wanted to say something about what NAP's role in all in all of this is. Um, and we uh, try, uh, one of our main goals is to serve as the medical home for our patients. And, and part of that uh, is to be the place where provide where patients and families can come and get all of their you know, medical and other needs met. And as part of that, we have a couple of uh, people that work with us uh, who serve in a role as a medical home care coordinator. And they do a great job of, of just trying to bring all of the resources, community resources together and connect families with uh, organizations like Jennifer at the, at the Field Center who, you know, or other organizations in the area. Um, some of our other roles include, you know, we want to help and identify children at risk for autism to using some of those screening tools that um, Jennifer mentioned. Um, referring for diagnosis and treatment, and this, our care coordinators help sometimes figuring out. We have an up-to-date list of, you know, what those wait lists look like, and you know, we can't necessarily get people in sooner because there are long wait lists, but we can at least help to try to navigate that. Um, we do screening for those comorbid medical conditions that uh, you mentioned, um, and sometimes help to manage those comorbid conditions. Like I, I, Jennifer mentioned, if there are um, you know, you're waiting for an ABA treatment or other therapy, um, and you're trying to 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 get that done. She can help out with that. We sometimes uh, will try to fill in the gaps there as well as you're waiting for for treatment. So those are some of the things that we do in that. But we're really thankful to have somebody like uh, someplace like the Field Center available in our community to to help us because it is a big topic and a big and and. Uh, a big issue and, and becoming more common, like you mentioned. It, you know, that the national statistics you mentioned, Jennifer, about the CDC and one in, it was about one in 45, one in 44 um, patients being diagnosed with it, is it, it, our, our NAP statistics are, are on par with that. So it's about two to, it's about two to three percent. And so just looking through our numbers, it's a similar kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so I, I don't know if, if people out there do have questions and wanna I, I either I guess you can raise their hand or, or throw something in the chat, um, that would be great. Um, one of the things, um, actually, so this is a question that's come in, Jennifer, maybe you can uh, speak to. Uh, and the question says, uh, in advocacy efforts with parents, caregivers who attend IEP eligibility meetings, uh, uh, one of our patients is noticing a trend towards school districts' unwillingness to add ASD into the IEP eligibility criteria. Um, and, and, I, and I'm Jan, my camera's not working, I'm sorry. And, oh. I can add, and I can add to that, so I didn't want to make a monster long chat, that um, th they'll say, well, it's, um, you know, more assigned, even though the uh, evals, the ADOS comes positive for ASD, even though the independent that we're reviewing, say, you know, is pointing in that direction, it's clearly noted as the primary disability on the, the uh, you know, written report. Um, but we really just see that the primary challenge and the traits that this child presents is communication. So we're just going to say it's a communication disorder. And they would, and here's the classic line, and they would get the same services, whether we make it the 
speech and language service, speech and language communication, primary disability, or if we snuck autism in there, the child will get the same thing. Yeah, so I can I can definitely speak to that. Um, and <laughs> Jan is a good friend, so it's, yes. it's good to hear your voice. It's good to hear your your voice yeah. and the work that you do in the Valley is wonderful. Um, so the, the, what you bring up, Jan, is really critical, which is there's a difference between an educational classification of autism as one of the six areas that children receive um, an IEP around, right? And a medical diagnosis of autism. And you need a medical diagnosis to get any, obviously, insurance covered services. So in home services, um, most ABA companies um, require a medical diagnosis of autism. Unfortunately, sometimes school districts will push back and say, well, just because you have a medical diagnosis of autism doesn't mean that you meet the educational classification, meaning that you are not um, impaired enough by this area, right, to fall under that classification. And that can be really challenging for families and for parents and as well as for practitioners who are saying, look, this kid is, this kid is clearly on the spectrum. Um, what I encourage families to do is outside of getting advocates like yourself um, and, you know, helping some, having someone help them come to the school meetings and advocate is to point out how many of the deficits their child has or the skills their child is lacking are uh, symptomatic of the core deficits of autism, right? So yes, at, at, you know, at its heart, um, a big part of autism is it's a communication uh, disorder, right? But at the same time, it's not necessarily a speech problem. It could be a language problem, meaning the difference between articulation and actual speech and pragmatics or the social use of language. So the important thing that I always have parents do is tie it right back to those core symptoms and how they are presenting themselves in the school district. The other thing is there's two different things that the school might consider. One is the IEP or the Individualized Education Program, plan and program. Um, and one is the 504 plan, which is sort of like uh, IEP light, some people say, which provides um, some less services and just saying they need accommodations. I would definitely, you know, encourage people to be persistent and fight for what their child needs in the school district, but to remember that if their child is young or wherever their child is on the educational journey, they're going to be working with these people for 22 years <laughs> for potentially, or, you know, 20 years, uh, let's say. So it's really important to create a unified approach and to be supporting together, listen to what they say, and also bring your backup information. I don't know if that helps, Jan. Does that make sense? Yeah, the medical um, two classifications and to try to like tighten the knot and say, you know, that the medical and educational are both met. That's that's the tricky, that's the rub of it when you have school districts who don't even want to use the ADOS to for evaluation. And then, you know, you're you're forced then as a caregiver to be looking for independent evals by evaluators, and the wait list is incredible, who are licensed and certified to do it. You know, because then if you don't get the ADOS to, then you're kind of SOL because you can't get eligibility for medical or educational, you know? Right. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's very tricky. And that's why I encourage parents to start at the moment they have any concern to start with those screening tools, bring them to a place like NAP and um, get the, get the ball rolling as early as possible. You know, even that, that really challenging transition age of going from three, right, and having early intervention services, and then going into the school system, it's, it's really beneficial if a child receives a diagnosis before they're three, right? So not only can they get early intervention services, but they can also help ease that transition into the school system. And it's very unlikely that a school system is going to deny a child who's been served under an autism diagnosis in birth to three, much less likely that they're going to, you know, deny that that's the category they should be served under. Right. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Know, you. Jennifer, this is a, this raises actually a question that I've had, which is, you know, as autism is becoming more, um, more common or almost more commonly diagnosed and the 
the time, the wait lists to getting a full evaluation are getting longer and longer. We're seeing more patients coming in saying, you know, looking you know, for the screening. And so we'll do a screening and it'll say, you know, this looks like somebody who, you know, could likely have autism and we refer out and that could take some time. And so there's some question about, well, when can the pediatrician make a, a provisional or, or some kind of a diagnosis? And we don't necessarily have the bandwidth to do the, the ADOS screening or all of that, the specific screening to make the diagnosis. Sometimes it's clear, but a lot of times there's questions about how to do that. So I wondered what the, there were pros and cons to having a provisional or early um, autism diagnosis. So there are times when, you know, putting a diagnosis on there would potentially be a, a negative uh, thing if it was done too early or it wasn't fully borne out or uh, what, what, do, what is your, what are your thoughts about, about that? Yeah, I think that's a good question, Dr. Everett. I mean, to be honest, I've, I've, almost never seen a pediatrician give a provisional diagnosis. And then we all thought, nah, I think they were wrong. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's pretty uh, common, is much more common for a pediatrician, unfortunately, to miss some of the early signs because you have such a short visit and they might be meeting some milestones, but not other milestones and, um, and not getting it. So I, um, I don't worry at all about pediatricians over identifying kids that are at risk for autism or might benefit from a provisional diagnosis. The trick is that a provisional diagnosis is, you know, only as good as the paper it's written on or the virtual record it's on. Um, it is unlikely that that's going to lead to services through your insurance company, for example. Um, however, a provisional diagnosis will allow a Department of Public Health treatment um, facility, so like ServiceNet. Um, I'm sorry, not ServiceNet anymore, but uh, Beacon, um, the May Center, all these organizations or these ABA agencies that serve kids under three will accept a provisional diagnosis, or, or most of them do. Um, but over the age of three, it is, it is pretty uncommon that that be you know, helpful. I think where it helps is when the neurologist or the developmental psychologist, whoever is looking at it, comes in and you've already completed a screening tool, and I do this a lot, I do assessments or I do school observations. And I tell the parents, like, bring it all in, bring it all in, because the more information they have, the better. So it's really of service to the diagnostician. And, you know, of course, they'll come to their own conclusions, but it's extremely helpful, I've been told, uh, for a child to come with that information. So I think it's, it's always worth it. Right. And in terms of downsides, I, I, don't see any, I don't see any particular downsides. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so yes, if there are other, if others have uh, questions or want to, um, chime in either through the chat or, um, raising their hand or, or unmuting, you certainly, um, you certainly can, or, or just a direct message chat would be okay as well. Um, you, um, did raise a good question that, um, I wanted to ask more about, but, um, I guess one other thing I, I, I would wonder about would be, you had talked a little bit about ABA therapy. You were going to start talking about floor time. Um, can you talk a little bit about, it sounds like ABA may be falling out of, I, this is certainly one of the main um, evidence-based treatments for autism, but you mentioned that there are some people who said, this didn't work for me. Um, what do you tell, what do you tell parents who are, you know, hesitant to pursue ABA? Um, and or thinking about something else. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't get a chance to go back over that. Um, you know, again, it has to fit with the culture of the family, the feasibility of the family, the time the family has. Some ABA agencies, I mean, they're certainly not all created equal, right? And some ABA agencies will say, oh no, we do 30 or 40 hours a week. And if you can't do that, then we're not going to serve you. Um, and that's fine. That's their, you know, that's what they're doing. Um, others will do just parent training, for example, until you can get up and going with a um, direct service provider or a therapist. They're often called registered behavior technicians. And that's what the field center we put in the schools to work one-on-one -on -one mostly with individuals or in school, in a classroom, special education classrooms. So you can often get 
little beginnings um, before you can get sort of the whole package. And I encourage people to go ahead and start with different agencies if they feel like they're hesitant about it and ask those questions right out the right out the gate. Um, look, my neighbor is autistic and he told me that he hated his ABA sessions. We, you know, how is what you guys do different than what you were doing 25 years ago or 30 years ago? Um, and it also comes down to the goodness of fit with the provider, right? Or the BCBA, I would say, with the, in terms of the ABA agencies. And just really working closely with that person and realizing that it is um, a team effort, you know, because uh, like, for example, I go to, you know, a trainer, I go to a personal trainer, right? And I go there, I go to her house and I always sit there and we work out and it's a really great, you know, hour. And then I go home and I don't do anything. <laughs> and they're not going to get any stronger, right? Um, and it's the same sort of thing. So you can have an ABA person or a floor time person come into your home and work with your child, but it's the rest of your life, right? That you have to do to really improve the quality of life for yourself, your child, and your other children, if that, you know, if you have that as well. And so it's important that you make that connection with that person because it's not just that they're going to be there for maybe an hour a week or two hours a week or whatever it is. Sometimes it's much, much more than that. Um, but it's that they're going to be helping you generalize or work to teach your child the same skills or, or new skills when they're not there as well. So um, it's really important that you have that good, solid connection. It's important that you ask right out. If you have hesitations, tell them. Um, and, you know, I will admit, sometimes I introduce myself as a BCBA, but the good kind. Um, and, uh, you know, some of my colleagues don't care for that. Um, I'm actually trained in floor time as well. So I feel really strongly about using an eclectic approach. And that's me. That's who I am as a professional and as a person. And uh, other BCBAs might be different. Uh, but that's, that's how I see it. Great. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Um... Um, great. I, I, another question I wondered about, um, and again, if anybody uh, wants to, to chime in with questions, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, I wondered a little bit about uh, the pandemic and uh, we're doing this, you know, before the pandemic, we would do all these um, workshops in person in our NAP office and we've shifted to online like so many things have. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm guessing that, and during the pandemic, you know, we couldn't be in person. That must have affected um, how ABA was delivered. What uh, effects have you seen, you know, since we've done so much online with either with the treatment that you're seeing or with assessments? I'm, I'm sure that, and I'm even sure if assessments like the ADOS can be effectively done online or it affects things. Uh, what's, what's changed for you in the last couple of years? Uh, pretty much everything. <laughs> um, it was sort of like a, a perfect storm for me opening the, a physical center right before the pandemic and promptly shutting it down about a month later. Um, so we're, we're, we were happy to be able to open our doors about a year ago. And, you know, people are masked, as you can see in the pictures. Um, and we take, you know, safety precautions and, and have people fill out things like other clinics. Um, but one thing that I noticed is that some children, especially school age children, actually did extremely well during the pandemic because there wasn't the level of social stress or social intensity. Their anxiety wasn't as bad, oddly. Um, and they were able to really focus on the schoolwork aspect, which often is um, not the problem, right? It's, it's work on the school, but it's all the other stuff. It's taking a break or going to lunch or, you know, doing all those other things. But I would say the majority of the, the families and the children that I work with did not do well um, in the pandemic. And it was very, very challenging because the tendency to, to isolate and therefore withdraw a little bit from society is, is, is very strong when you have a child with special needs of any kind of special needs, you know, and autism. One of the things that people will say when they come to our, like our early childhood um, group is it's just so amazing to be in a non-judgment zone, right? Um, where, you know, their kid can hit another kid or fall on the floor screaming or crying or whatever it is, and no one's going to judge them for that. Um, so in that way, when, as we're all sort of slowly coming out of our homes and coming back together as a community, I think, uh, having an awareness around that and being more compassionate for one another is something that certainly, you know, that did do that. 
um, we can thank the pandemic for that. Mm. The other piece is that I do my family navigation sessions online. It's just easier. One parent can be somewhere. One parent can be another place. I can be in my car, <laughs> which sometimes I am. Um, and so that's that's helpful. And then the Life Guide Coaching for Adults program is primarily online as well, although she does do you know, meet people in the community and stuff. But everything else we do is in person because it's really important about making those social connections. Mm -hmm. um, and actually I, I will plug a little bit further, but the groups that we, we do are not, I don't call them social skills groups and that's on purpose because I don't believe or the philosophy of the center is that we don't believe in teaching people how to be neurotypical or teaching them how to be typical in their social interaction. We want them to make connections with other people. So two kids like Legos, uh, they're both autistic and they're coming together and, you know, developing the, a joint project, something like that. So uh, it can, it can look a little funny from the outside sometimes, because we really don't pressure kids to, to engage more than they want to. Um, but when those true connections happen, it's really very valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, it occurs to me, I mean, just having the pandemic and doing so much online, I mean, our, all of our communication like I, uh, how we communicate has changed so much, right? Yeah. So a lot of the communication you're trying to teach through ABA, uh, that social communication happens in person. And there's so many nonverbal cues and maybe even biologic cues that happen in person that don't happen, you know, through this digital, you know, filtering, right? Yeah. I, I just I don't know if you if there's if you notice any difference in, you know, how children with autism communicate if they're on screens or that versus in person or how the therapies work that way? Yeah. So again, it depends, right? Because you've met one autistic person, you've met, met one, one autistic person. Yeah. Exactly. And so, um, oh, I'm forgetting who said that now and he's going to kill me, but uh, <laughs> that professor down at Rutgers. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, you know, it really depends on, um, on who you're talking about and, and how they interact with the world. I will say, so my brother was uh, becoming a, a teenager, you know, uh, about 20, 25 years ago. Um, and the first time they had developed um, AOL chat, online chat or whatever it was, he learned to have a conversation. He had never had a reciprocal conversation in his life until they created this digital format and he was able to do it without all that extra stuff. So he wasn't worried about, well, what are they looking at? Or what are they saying with their eyes? Or what, you know, all that stuff. Cause it was just the words. And um, somehow that taught him that like back and forth um, reciprocal communication. And he still does it. Uh, he still texts with me all the time now. So um, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely interesting for some people that the, the texting is much easier than a, um, you know, a face-to-face -face or a phone conversation. Mm -hmm. So it really depends. It depends on the individual, but thank goodness we have all these strategies now that we didn't have before because we have all these ways of, of, uh, of coming together. Right. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I, I've heard that phrase before. You've met one child with autism. You've met one child <laughs> with autism. And that, that's, that's a good point is that there's, there may be some things that work for one child um, and will help quite a bit some kind of technology and for others it may not fit quite as much and we see that all the time that's why yeah you know, I, I see patients with autism and talk with families uh, say a similar thing is that it's a matter of getting to know who this who this child is and, and treat him or her as as him or her and not just put them in a box of autism autism a diagnosis can certainly unlock um you know, therapies and treatments and insurance payments and things like that uh, but it doesn't necessarily define them as a, as an individual. So exactly. Uh, and I, you know, I tell parents a similar thing. I say, it's another lens, right? Mm -hmm. Your child is still your child. They're every bit as much your child today as they were yesterday. Um, you know, before the diagnosis and, uh, this is just a lens to help you, you know, autism doesn't, when I'm helping children who have, uh, challenging behaviors, you know, someone will say, oh, he's autistic. And it's like, well, that doesn't tell me anything, right? Um, tell me like a little more about, about this child or what motivates them or, you know, what interests them and, and things like that. So I think it's really important to, to remember that autism is not um, sort of a, a catch-all phrase for, for behavior or challenging behavior, but it's a way to understand it, mm -hmm. right? And that's what I tell people. So yeah. it's a, it makes it a little easier to put our, ourselves in, in that person's shoes um, and, and to be able to do that. Yeah, great. 
It was Stephen uh, Shore, by the way. Stephen Shore was the guy who said that. Right. Now you won't be in trouble. <laughs> now I won't be in trouble. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> We're um, we're approaching the the end of our, our time. Uh, if there are any other questions out there that people want to share or or chime in, please please do so. Um, and again, all of our, our contact information for the Field Center and all the links that were shared during the, the presentation will be available uh, on our website and our, our workshop area uh, soon after this is over. So you can certainly reach us there or reach us through our website as well with further questions that you have. Um, are, are there, uh, Jennifer, are there other, I guess, other final thoughts that you might have either this, uh, you have some great advice there at the end for parents, uh, you know, who are concerned about autism. Do you have any you know, general like final advice for, for parents or uh, are there some like big misconceptions that people come in that you, you hear a lot that you feel like, you know, you know, need to often are not addressed ahead of time or they just things that we didn't get to today that you wanted to share. There, there are a million things we didn't get to, I can assure you. And, you know, um, I'm happy to have a conversation offline with, with anyone that's more interested in, in hearing more about um, what I do at the Field Center, what we do, and the kinds of work that we do. Um, I do think it's really important not to write anything off in life, you know? And so uh, just because ABA is getting sort of a bad rap these days doesn't mean it's horrible. Just because, you know, floor time doesn't have a ton of empirical support doesn't mean it's horrible um you know so there's lots of different things but remembering again that your child is your child first um and you know they will always be your child <laughs> uh and i think that's really important we didn't talk much about adults or young adults or teens uh certainly an average uh, massachusetts is the third um the third best state in terms of diagnosing early. Um, and so our average age of diagnosis is around three years old, 3.2 years old, which is excellent um, mm -hmm. compared to some of the states that are up to six, seven years old. Wow. So, um, and, you know, and even higher for um, females, for girls, mm -hmm. um, and even higher for um, people that aren't as impacted by their symptoms. So there's, you know, a lot of work to be done around the screening, the early identification, Massachusetts is doing great, um, but we can always do better because if you think about it, that's, you know, two years of services that we could get. Right. Right, no, that's 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 uh, it's true. I mean, three it is good compared to other states, but there's, you know, we're we doing screening regularly at at you know eighteen months, and you should be able to help identify kids earlier. Um, so, more work to do. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Everett and Lauren. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you sharing all this information. Uh, and thanks to everybody for joining us, or if you're joining us online after the fact, thank you for tuning in. Uh, as, a, as a reminder, we have these parent workshops once uh, a month, uh, and uh, there are, is a, a schedule on our website. The next one will be, I think, the first or second uh, Sunday in April. I think the topic is going to be about uh, something about uh, uh, disordered eating and nutrition so if that's uh interesting to you or somebody you know then share that with them and if you have other topics that you want to uh you think we should cover let us know as well um uh, great well thank you jennifer thank you everybody and um we'll see you at the next one thank you guys happy spring goodbye <laughs>